Good afternoon. This is September 11th, 1998. We're at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and today we have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Bernard, or Bernie, Feldman. Good afternoon, Mr. Feldman. Good afternoon. You? Could you tell us your current address? I presently live in South Natick, Massachusetts, 01760. And how long have you lived in Natick? I've lived in Natick 40 plus years. And you are married? I am married. Your wife's name? Ruth. And your children? I have two daughters, uh, Susan and Linda. I have two granddaughters, Jennifer and Marcy. And may I ask your age? I am now 74 years old. And over the past 40 years, have you seen a lot of changes in Natick? Oh, we certainly have. What, what strikes you as probably the most glaring change? The glaring change is right here in downtown Natick. Downtown. Especially this past year with our new library here, the new police station, the new fire station, the new town hall, and more new schools to come. Did your children go to the schools in Natick? Uh, my uh, youngest daughter went to all the Natick schools. Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up? I started out uh, when I was around a year and a half to two in Saxonville. Saxonville, which is a part of Framingham. Part of Framingham. Mm -hmm. I went to the first and second grade in Saxonville. After that, I was about seven or eight when I moved to Roxbury, that's when our family got together again. As I said, I was a state ward and was separated for a number of years. And you were separated from your siblings, your, your brothers, brother and sister? Right. And your sister was older? My sister was older, my brother was older, I was the baby. And you got back together in Roxbury? In Roxbury, oh, about 1931, somewhere around there. And that is because, and I'm just repeating what you told me off my, camera. My uh, sister started a home for all of us, brought my father back. And she was only, how old at that time? 16. Mm. And uh, the people I lived with in Saxville actually brought me up until I was about seven. Was that a good experience for you, in spite of the fact that you were away from your family? I felt it was, based on the people that uh, brought me up. And once you moved back with your family, did you stay in contact with the Saxonville family? Every weekend. You did. Yeah. It was hard, because yeah. I accepted uh, the people in uh, Saxonville as my parents. Mm -hmm. And when I went back, it was uncomfortable. Sure. It took a while. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then do you have a very special relationship with your sister, having almost Still raised do. you after that? Yes. She was like my little mother. Now your brother, how old was he? He was two years younger, 14 at that time. Two years younger than your sister? Right. Mm -hmm. Did he go into the military? Yes, he went in uh, before Pearl Harbor. He was in the Air Force, an aerial photographer. And he was in the service about six years. And when and where did you enter the military? I entered the military from Brighton on Calm Avenue. Were you? I still lived in Roxbury at the time. And draft time was coming up. I was still in high school. And I decided to go down and uh, try to get in the Navy before. I did not want to go in the Army. And uh, I did. They accepted me. How old were you at that time? 18 years old. So you enlisted in the Navy at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And once you enlisted, where did you go? Once I enlisted, I was sent to Newport, Rhode Island, to boot camp for my training. I spent eight weeks at boot. Then I was shipped to Brooklyn. 
New York. New York. Assigned to the armed guard, which was voluntary. And the armed guard is Navy gunners on merchant machine, uh, marine ships. I was assigned to the SS SO, uh, George Harrison Smith, which is the name of the ship, which was a tanker. The tanker was quite old at that time. Uh, it was one of the larger ones at that time, which was about 500 odd feet long and 75 feet wide. And within uh, eight weeks, I was already on a ship ready to go overseas. Were you prepared to do that? Not really. Were you scared about going overseas? Well, I'll tell you, yes and no. I, I, because you're 18 and 17, I don't think any of them are scared. That's why they made good soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were ready for the battle. So Everyone was fighting. Uh, they realized they were fighting for a cause. And on this ship, did you establish any close friendships? Yes, I did. Do you still maintain friendships with any of them? What few are around, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we established more friendship and togetherness with all the service people, more so than we did in school. I mean, it was, it was just great brotherhood. Everyone took care of each other, regardless of color, race, creed. Uh, we were all in for the same cause. And I think it created a bond even after the war. Now, during basic training, were there any specialties that you were learning that would be specific to being on the ship? An aerial gunner. Explain something about aerial gunnery. I was a 20 millimeter specialist, which was an anti-aircraft gun. And obviously in the North Atlantic, uh, we could not use our guns too often for the simple reason there was no airplanes there, it was all submarines. And uh, because of the convoys, we were, because of a tanker and the cargo we carried, and we carried aeroplanes, we were in the middle of the convoy, which protected us to some degree. So most of the ships that went under were either on the fringe edges of the convoys. And uh, the first trip that I was on, we lost half our convoy. So that was an experience to me. Scared, yes. Did it, did it sort of enforce in you that this was serious business and...? I thought it was serious business because everyone thought it was serious business. Everyone was joining up to fight the war, protect the country, uh, and there was no holding back. Getting back to Roxbury, just bumping back for a minute, did any of your friends that you had established friendships with in Roxbury join up? Yes. And did they join up with you or did they go this way? Mostly all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, give or take. When one did, the rest of them wanted to do. They didn't want to be behind. Mm -hmm. So yes, you, it's, true. it's true. So you were an aerial gunner. Where, did you know where you were going when you were um, in no. this convoy? No. We didn't know until we got into the uh, English Channel. Then we knew we were going to, the first trip was to Ireland, Belfast. Uh, which was a rough trip, like I said. We were losing more ships than we were getting through. And uh, we were not allowed to pick up any survivors. We had to keep going. What was that like? It was terrible when you hear people yelling and couldn't pick them up because they had only lived for about five minutes in the cold water. But a lot of them were Germans too. Uh, from the uh, torpedo, not the torpedo so much as the uh, depth charges. 
uh, we would have liked to have gotten more, but it wasn't successful. We had the Canadian uh, Corvettes, which were a little small, like the size of PT boats, uh, escorting the convoys, and they were not effective at all. So there was a lot of loss of life around you. I'm sorry, what years were these that you that were That was in? right in uh, 1943. That was the worst part of the whole thing, the worst part of the uh, experience with the armed guard. Now, when you were in Belfast, did you ever have any kind of, and I don't mean to sound naive if this is a stupid question, but did you ever have any kind of shore leave at all, or were you, you did? And what, yes. what, what, what was it like? Uh, it's sad to say, uh, being on a ship, you'd be out to sea for two and a half weeks, you'd get into port, on a tanker, it's a question of unloading and leaving. So if we had 24 hours, we had a lot. Where do you think we went to? The, the bar. The first one you could find. And it didn't take much to be carried back. And that was pretty much it. And there was one occasion where the ship had to go into dry dock or something. We had a couple of weeks off. So then we really had a good time. Partied a bit. Partied plenty. <laughs> And uh, that was Belfast, and the next trip was Liverpool. And uh, when you arrived in these areas, was there a lot of devastation on the land? In uh, Belfast, it was. And, and was that something that you didn't anticipate? Did it come as a surprise? At to that you? time, we didn't know what was happening over there. Mm -hmm. we were just going, bringing supplies, until we got there and saw what was going. They, they kept us in the dark all the time. That's where we had that V-mail and everything. You couldn't even let anybody at home know where you were. Can you explain V-mail to the audience? V-mail is a very reduced form, one-sided, where you're limited to how many words you can put on there. And you write home and uh, send money, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, try to get the message across in between the lines. That's all you were allowed to mail at that time because I guess the air mail was far and in between. And V-mail was done after you had already start writing, writing ho started writing home on regular paper or stationery. The V-mail was probably a quarter of the size of the stationery that you were using? Yes, and that was basically when you were out of the country. And would you talk about one of the pieces of V-mail that you showed me prior to going on tape was something to your sister, Rose? Right. You wrote quite a bit to Rose. I wrote it, quite a bit, keeping her informed as much as I could what was going on. One particular piece I read, which was a V-mail, you were not able, and in the letter you stated you were not able to tell her where you were going. No, at that time, we were. this was not in the North Atlantic now, I believe, or, or again, it could have been. We were headed out in the Pacific to Guadalcanal and Tulagi, and we just couldn't tell anybody where we were going at that time. So backing up then to, to Ireland, after going to Ireland and Liverpool and, and possibly some dry dock, tell us a little bit more about what transpired over in the areas of Europe with you. At uh, Belfast and Liverpool? Mm -hmm. Well, other than unloading cargo, and we had the chance to get ashore. We met all the people there, the women, and uh, everyone was so friendly, they couldn't do enough for us. Come home with us, they fed us. We never needed any money. Uh, with our $78 a month, it only lasts one day anyway. <laughs> we made a lot of money then. And uh, forgot everything about the trip. Just went out and says, hey, tomorrow's another day. Let's have a ball. And we did. And another advantage, I would assume, is that you spoke the same language. So Spoke the same language. Even though it might have been your first time overseas, is that correct? It was my first time overseas. I mean, we made fun of them because they sounded like they were all from Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, 
still getting letters from some of my old girlfriends. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah, my wife had to write them, told her, tell them I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were they were nice. What can I tell you? Mm -hmm. They were nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say the same on the uh, Pacific side, but England, Ireland, Scotland, they're all nice. And how long were you in that area? For about a year and a half. So you would come in and load and unload supplies for the armies that were on shore? We unloaded that? for the Air Force, which we had the airplanes, and the oil for the airplanes. Uh, there was one trip that we went over there, and we were in the English Channel, and we got hit. That was the second trip. Uh, we got hit by an English ship. We're in the English Channel. You can't see. I mean, the whole time you're out there, you cannot see. There's no lights, nothing. Uh, you're just sailing in hope. And we got hit, and we lost 75 feet of the bow with the cargo. And uh, that's when I got hurt on there and uh, banged up my knee and my elbow just by getting hit. And there I am in the gun tub, and I'm ready to shoot that ship because I thought it was a German ship. And then we had a 90-day wander on there, which they called our commander, which was an ensign. He's been in 90 days, and he's uh, in charge. Here you had gunner's mates on there that had been in for a couple of years, and this ensign knew nothing. He had a nervous breakdown by the time we got there. Did he really? Yeah. Because he was he not prepared. Couldn't handle us either. Mm. There was only 11 of us. That was the whole crew, 11. So, uh, yeah, we lost the bow, and that's when I said we went into dry dock, and they filled it up with concrete, and we came back, luckily. And dry dock would last, what, a month? About two weeks. Two weeks. So yeah, and then quickly. we came back to Brooklyn, we were in dry dock, and they built a new bow, and boom, out again. But uh, it was an experience. My first two trips were the experience. After that, it was not too, too bad at all. Why? Because at that time, they didn't have aircraft carriers. Once they had these small baby carriers, they were able to attack the subs. Because there must have been 500 submarines out there. And boy, did they do a job. They did a job. So that's for the first couple of years I was out, a year and a half, year and three quarters in the North Atlantic. And then when did things change? Things changed when I came home and had my 30 days, got plenty of gasoline, plenty of stamps, plenty of, uh, I don't know if they had nylon stockings then or not. Silk stockings, oh, we got home, there was plenty for everybody. And uh, then I went to Virginia, and then they tried to fix up my knee and my elbow, and I was there in the hospital for three months. And when I got out of the hospital, they, I was at Fargo Building for one month, and I said, I gotta get out of here, you gotta give me another ship. I can't afford staying here. Were you still single at this time? Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, they gave me, believe it or not, an old, Russian freighter, but they call it a Hog Islander, and it took like 90 days to cross the uh, Pacific with this ship. No convoys in the Pacific. Didn't need a convoy. Pacific was what, uh, about 18 times bigger than the North Atlantic. Yeah. So you're on your own in this? On your own until we get close to destination. Then you had escort ships come out and bring you in. And at this point in time, were you clear on where you were going? or, or no? Not until we got close to where we were going. Which was? At that time, we went, I went the first trip. I went to uh, New Caledonia, of all places. And... Uh, you were not allowed to go to shore there because of leprosy. Mm -hmm. So 
control me. I had to find out a way to get ashore. So I developed a toothache. And I went to my little answer man. He says, well, you know, I got a bad toothache. I got to get off this ship. So they took me into the shore, sent me to the dentist. I didn't have a toothache, but I was able to spend the day over there. Was yeah. it curiosity because of the leprosy that you wanted to go, or just to see? I think combination of both, being on board for so long, uh, just to get off the ship. Yeah, curious, curious. It was terrible. You saw? You saw people falling apart, uh, hungry, nothing there, barren, because where we were, even if you wanted to go somewhere, you couldn't. And uh, that was that trip then, all the way back, another 90 days. We'd go to either Aruba or Curacao, load up with oil, planes, go back again. Another 90 days. What was a typical day like when you were? Very boring. Mm -hmm. We played pinochle 50 hours a day. That was the game, pinochle. And we Go ahead. We were in debt, you know, forever. And that's primarily what you could do. I mean, we all had our chores, you know, keep the guns clean and everything, but mm -hmm. we had a lot of free time. As far as the merchantmen were concerned, I mean, we lived like first-class citizens. They catered to us. And these were the merchant marines on the ship? Mm-hmm. So was it almost like you were catching a ride, or? We were catching a ride or defending the ship mm -hmm. and the men that were on the ship by manning the guns. That was our responsibility to protect the ship. And you had mentioned earlier it was an old Russian freighter? The, yeah, it was the least from the Russians. By? By the Americans. Americans, and, and they were merchant mariners versus? Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And most of these merchant marines, because of the uh, cargo we carried, it was considered hazardous duty. So they would get double pay. So when it came payday at the end of the month, they passed the hat and gave all our sailors money to go ashore. Otherwise, we didn't have anything. They made the money. We made the $78. <laughs> And uh, they were good to us, and food was no problem on a merchant ship. And it was a little, quite an experience going through the canals, the Panama canals, staying at Panama, uh, jumping ship in the water, going to the other ships, and then we would raise hell with us because they informed us there's sharks all over there. After the fact. After the fact. Well, no one got eaten up. <laughs> but as far as doing crazy things, we did. Go over the island, you know, you hust around with the natives, the cactus fields out there. You got stung a few times. But, uh, you know, three years went by fast. It went right real fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, Did you hear about other aspects of the war that might have been going on elsewhere? Only towards the end. Mm -hmm. What well, were you hearing? About, you know, Germany and how they were starting to get defeated. And then we had to go to knock out the Jap uh, Japanese and not enough. We didn't get too much. Yeah, we got the pointer, like I showed you, which the, tried to keep us abreast what was going on. And that was a newsletter it was magazine. It was a Navy newsletter, mm -hmm. or the Arm Guard newsletter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite an experience. I think I learned manhood at uh, 18, 19, and uh, 20. You learned it quickly. Real fast. And I think I'm better off for it today because uh, I belong to the uh, VFW right down here 
and for the, what have I been in, about five years now? I think I've cre uh, created such a bond uh, with all the members down there, and I consider myself at post-1274 a minority, because as far as the uh, Jewish veterans are concerned, if there's a half a dozen out of 400, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you something, they treat us unbelievable. Tom Carr, Ed Carr, John McGilvery, we even made him a member of our own organization, the Jewish War Veterans. And the Jewish War Veterans, is that out of Framingham? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And but you many? know we're more accepted in Natick than Framingham. I've heard that. Okay, I'm telling you right now, they are fantastic. How many belong to that organization? We got about a hundred. And how long have you been involved with that? Well, I've been a member for like 25 years, but uh, the last five, ten years, like I was commander of the post, now I'm past commander, still very heavily involved. We have a breakfast group on Fridays every morning, 52 weeks a year, about 15, 20 guys show up. Where do you go? Now we're meeting up in Wethersfield at the G&G. &G. Uh, before we were at uh, Sorella's, they closed. Can I get back to some of your experiences, um, which will I know then at, end up talking about present day, but looking back now, what do you think were some of your greatest challenges that you had to face? Uh, was one boredom? Yes, boredom out in the seas. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think in the North Atlantic there was any boredom. Most of the boredom was in the South Pacific. Uh, the North Atlantic, again, everything out there was a challenge. When you're in, I don't know if you ever sailed the North Atlantic, but the waves are twice as high as the ship. Mm -hmm. Now, being on a tank and being loaded with oil and planes and everything, we look like a submarine we're so far in the water. So that no matter which way you turn and everything, you're always flooded with water. And was it like 20, 30 degrees below zero? And we were out standing watch, trying to find something. You couldn't find anything. So weather was a real challenge, the, the, the high was a seas. Challenge. Some of the uh, shipmates became so bored and troubled, one of them even shot himself in the foot so he could get off the ship. So mm -hmm. what happened, he lost it. Mm -hmm. So it could create a problem, mm -hmm. uh, boredom. So what we try to do is, you know, make our own good time on board ship and play cards and Tell do me our about chores the dangers of some of the things that you had to load on the ship. I know you mentioned it prior to going on tape about one of the warheads. Well, this is another ship now. Okay. We'll get on to the LSTs. That's towards the end of my tour. Okay. Right. Um, the dangers are on board. Our responsibilities were strictly guns. So all the dangers involved the merchantmen, getting the ships loaded, tied down, ready to go. All we had to do was make sure our guns worked. And uh, yes, when we got out to sea, we would sh shoot at nobody just to make sure they worked. But again, we had never had a chance in the North Atlantic to shoot anything down because there was no planes there at the time, just uh, subs. However, it was a challenge. It was bored. Uh, uh, we had to encourage each other that we'll be there tomorrow, we'll have fun, and we'll be on the way back. But see, you never knew where tomorrow would be because they were going down. Ships were going down all around you. So you didn't know if you were going to get hit or not. Mm -hmm. And you got used to it. Like everything else, you get used to it. I'm sure the people in the Army, when they went into Normandy, they just went until something happened. So you, you were on the North Atlantic, and then you leased the Russian freighter for the South Pacific, is that correct? Yeah, at 
one point we I picked up a freighter, and that was in the uh, South Pacific. And tell us about the LSTs. Where did that all happen, and when? The LST came into play like about six months before the end of the war. And explain what an LST is. It's a landing craft. I have pictures of it here. And what the, I picked this ship up in uh, Pensacola, Florida. And this was an LST-61, so you can see how old it was. It's already served its purpose in landings. Uh, they were outfitting this sh uh, LST, which is a landing craft, to be able to launch U-2 bombs. And uh, while I was in Pensacola, once the ramps were built and everything, they were loading these bombs on the ship so that we could go out for a test run and shoot them or launch them. Well, while they were loading the bomb, the crane broke, which I showed you the picture of, and the bomb fell inside the hole. And who else was in the hole? I was down there. I had the rope trying to guide it, and boom. So I didn't get crushed with it, but I didn't. And if there was uh, the head, of the uh, bomb was armed in front, the nose, the whole ship would have been gone. But no, that was all right. So then they brought in some more to load on. And then the following week, we're going to go out and test it. And then we got a radio call, do not fire, come back. And we came back, and the reasons told was that the ship would never survive the concussion of the bomb. I could understand why, too. So you think it was poor planning on someone's part? Did you Absolutely. see that happen a lot during the war? I know the little uh, the Liberty ships that went over there. They're all welded. They're only if they made one landing, they were fine. That was it. They did their job. Otherwise, they'd fall apart. They did fall apart. I don't know how many they built a, a month, but boy, they turned them out pretty quick. That was the Liberty ships. But uh, the LST, uh, I never left the States with it. Mm -hmm. But it was a good experience. Um, and before you know it, the war was over. And here I am, still talking about it. So once you came home, what was it like coming back? To, I assume you came back to Massachusetts? Yes. What was it like coming back home after that experience? It was sad, and it felt also good to know that the country was free. We were all free, and the adjustment wasn't easy. Uh, what they had is what they call a 5220 club which you'd get $20 a week for 52 weeks. So when we had the $20 a week, we, we used to go downtown Boston to Leonardi's with our $20, pay up all the bills we owed, and then charge again. Well, this lasted close to the 52 weeks before we decided to find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And all the guys that came back, we would meet in Boston mm -hmm. and had a ball, could care about nothing, just loosen up. And at this point in time, you're in your early 20s? Yes. Yeah. Then you had to make a decision about your future. My future, I had odd jobs here and there. My future was, I met a girl, I got married. 1947, so you can see I got out in 46. Um, my wife was a little put out with me because even after I got married, it seems that I was always finding the guys. Until finally she put it, hey, what's going on here? Me or them? 
which I could understand. I didn't understand it then. Still kids, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to start buckling down. Now, is this your wife, Ruth? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 51 years of a. <laughs> yep. And uh, we had a daughter 11 months later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to start earning a living. So what did you do? I went on a job training because, again, I had a family already, so my plans were a little disrupted. And uh, I went to an automotive place in Boston. I was on a job training. They would give me $25, and I think I was getting 40 from the government, so I was getting like $65 a week. I was pretty good then. And then I learned and learned. I was with that company for 20 years and uh, struggled at times. And uh, when I got married, I moved in with the in-laws, and that wasn't a happy situation. And uh, just kept going to a point where uh, about when I was 47 years old, I, I went in business. For yourself? And what business was that? Uh, the Auto Sounds. I started the Auto Sound companies. I said, if I don't do it now, I never will. And it worked out for me. So would this be the stereo systems that people yes. would put in their cars? Yeah. Where was your first business? The first store was Brockton. The second store was uh, Stoneham. The third store was Framingham. And then after about 12 years, I sold out. And they're still going strong, Auto Sound. But my wife was very active in it. Because, you know, when you had more than one place, it had to be watched. Mm -hmm. So she was very active in it as long as we had the stores. And we did fine. Did you ever take advantage of the GI Bill? That was part of the GI. I was going to school nights, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. They offered the... I was taking up uh, electrical courses, and uh, I got uh, two years of BU, uh, two years of Wentworth Institute. Before I went to the service, I had close to four years of Boston trade, so I had a trade going on, and I was always involved in automotive, and still. I work three days a week today just to keep going. At just the age to, of 74, you're still working? Yep. Yeah. I'm working for someone that worked for me. <laughs> so it works out well. Sure. Yeah, I go in Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, Friday mornings, I go down and see my friend Tom, and he says, help me with the newsletter. This is Tom Carr? Yeah, that's Tom Carr. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it fills the week. How important, looking back now, how important do you feel the service to your country and in the military was and how it affected your life, past and present? Well, I feel it, uh, it affected my life in many ways based on my uh, background before I went into the service. Uh, I think it gave me a direction to go. Uh, not only fighting for our own country, our own freedom, uh, preserving what we had and didn't want to lose, or never had and wanted, uh, the friendship I established over the years, and even after the war, through the veterans organizations, made tremendous strides in friendship, comradeship, mm -hmm. helping others, helping the disabled vets, which I am now, mm -hmm. um, uh, getting what they need because there's very little money for them. 
uh, going, visiting the hospitals. I'm quite involved in that. So you, you do a lot for your community and your veterans community? Right, try to. Getting back to a comment that you made earlier about um, getting together with the guys even after you were married and your wife sort of putting her foot down. In looking back at that, do you feel a lot of that was because you had really missed out three years of your young adult life that you were still I think that would be play? part of it because we did miss a lot. Uh, but in turn, we gained on the other end by meeting other types of people in different countries. And what the world was more or like, which we never knew. So either way, we learned there or here. I think it was well-rounded out for everybody that was in the service. We've asked a number of veterans and get some very different responses from them, and I would like to ask you also of your opinion about the public opinion and the differences in public opinion regarding the veterans of World War II versus the veterans of Korea and those of Vietnam. Well, from what I understand and what I've seen and heard, most of the Vietnams are Koreans most of them did not really understand what they were fighting for. Uh, they were sacrificing their lives for what? Was it to protect our country? I don't think so. It was to protect others or to make sure that others, uh, if they didn't get conquered, maybe it would have affected us by it. But from what I understand, a lot of the, uh, especially Vietnam, they ran to Canada because they didn't want to, they didn't have a cause, they didn't feel they had a cause to fight for. World War II, they did have a cause. This whole country was threatened and everybody got up for the challenge. As and young you, as they were. And you feel then that the challenges that you met supported the war effort back in World War II? Definitely. Is there any other comment or um, thought, memory that you'd like to leave us with that can be not only for your family but for future generations or those who in the future may be doing research on this particular generation of, of veterans? Well, the only thought I have is that the generation today, unless we ourselves make them aware of what went on, what we went through, through the schools, uh, they are not aware today, I don't think, of uh, what happened in World War II or what World War II was about, unless the parents talk about it. Uh, it's part of history for this country. And I don't think the younger generation is up and aware of what we fought for. Do you feel that Projects like Spielberg, Saving Private Ryan, which is the most recent World War II uh, movie that has been out this summer, has been, I consider it to be well received by a number of different generations. Do you think that will help in bringing yes. about interest in things that happened back in the 1940s? I think so, because there's a lot of reality there. Did you see the movie? Yes, I did. Mm. Was that difficult for you? It was. Mm. It was. However, I mean, the first half hour almost told you everything. And the children that see it maybe made them aware of what World War II was about. But up till then, I don't know. I really don't know. Because you, you talk to children unless they come down the Native Square and see the July 4th parade and see a half a dozen veterans, that's all. It's just, it's sad. These veterans are getting so old. They can't walk anymore. 
I don't think there's more than half a dozen in the whole parade. It consists of the color guard, that's it. And it's sad, it really is. When it comes to the fourth, the flag day. Uh, yes, they're learning a lot about the flag because the Brown School, is it? Has a, Kennedy Middle School, right. well, that's where it's held. Right. They have the uh, exchange of flags, oh, flags. I think it's great. Yes. I really do. But it, it's not history on the war itself. Mm -hmm. But we did fight for that flag. Mm -hmm. At least I think we did. And there we are. Well, we'd like to thank you this afternoon for a very nice job in giving us your perspective of what went on during your career well, in the military. Thank you very much. We tried. And I do have literature here, whichever you would like. This one here shows the 61 on a landing. That was the ship I was on, so you can imagine what shape it was when I got on it. What we will do is we'll make copies of Fine. all of this information for our records. Beautiful. Well, I hope I contributed to the library. What do you think, fella? Well, we'd like to thank you again. Thank and, you very much. Um, we look forward to showing this and other tapes in the very near Good. future. Hopefully I come across, I'm not sure. I'm not that good an interviewer, so.